want to dive right in because we've got a lot of great uh, material to cover, a lot of exciting solutions that I want to share, and the work that we're doing on in as part of Cisco Emerging Technologies and Incubation. This is the R&D branch of Cisco. It's been uh, rebranded ETNI, and an area of focus that we've really been double-clicking on is cloud native solutions. So from cloud native connectivity, and then also cloud native security. So let's start with connectivity and just outlining the overall problem space. I'm sure everyone's familiar in a traditional approach to applications. Uh, we had all the components of the application sitting on either a physical or a virtual so server. These applications became very monolithic, very difficult then to upgrade. You had to do heavy lifting and reboots and a whole bit just to get uh, new, uh, new functionality in any one of these components. And so businesses realize there's more agility, um, benefits, scalability, flexibility by using a containerized microservice approach where all these individual components are then individually containerized, but now you have a whole new set of connections to manage. You not only have all the connections to and from your applications that you had previously, but now you have a whole host of new interconnections to observe, to secure, to manage. It's a whole new set of challenges that this new application architecture, though very beneficial, does present to the operators, the technical staff designed to support it, assigned to support it. One approach, one technology that's become very popular in dealing with these set of challenges is the service mesh. For instance, Istio or Linkerd. And using a service mesh, they're able to um, address some of these particular challenges is how do I ensure consistent authentication or encryption or observability into my application interconnections and I want to centralize that management of it and so by applying a service mesh that addresses this problem. However, like sometimes technology is want to do is that that presents some new challenges along the way. Now, particularly with a service mesh, the challenges could be grouped into, say, three key areas. Uh, managing the life cycle of the mesh, and I'll talk about that in more detail. Um, having consistent observability versus the fragmented and disparate observability that's currently available uh, using various open source tools. And then also managing multi-cluster scenarios and advanced use cases therein. I'm going to talk about each of them and also how we're bringing Cisco solutions to this um, to this space. So let's start with lifecycle management. If we want to take advantage of, say, new network functionality, well, we're all familiar. What we do on a network, we just upgrade the software on our routers and switches or wireless LAN controllers. We might be doing this manually or using an orchestrator to do it. And then now suddenly we have all this new functionality available to us. So we might think that based on that familiarity that that's all we have to do when dealing with upgrading to a new service mesh. We want to take advantage of that new uh, functionality. We're just going to upgrade that and be done with it. Well, actually, this isn't the, the way that this is done because of a very important cloud native principle called immutable infrastructure, which basically says once you've established the infrastructure, which includes the mesh, you never touch it. And so it's kind of like now your approach instead of upgrading these individual components is more like how you would change a tablecloth, a soiled tablecloth, for instance, in a restaurant. You wouldn't just fasten a new tablecloth to an old one and then try and do this really elaborate rip and replace. What you would actually do is you would set a new table, lay down a new cloth, gradually move everything that was on top of that cloth over. And then when everything was set, then you'd move your guests over and then everything is, everything is happy, and then you remove the old cloth. Okay, so that's a lot more complex um, as part of the life cycle management. And considering there are only, for instance, two versions, two supported versions of Istio, the current version and the previous, and they upgrade about every three months, you would have to perform this type of complex operation on every single one of your clusters. So we have some customers that have 150 or more clusters. That's a lot of toil. That's a lot of heavy lifting. We can simplify that and we automate that and we'll show that in the tool. Not only that, 
Then we're also integrating the observability. You see that there's so many different tools to give you different views of what's going on in your cloud native environment. You want to see metrics, you use Prometheus, Grafana. You want to use, um, see traces, you use Jaeger. You want to use, um, see topology, you use Kali and so on. And you have to switch from one pane of glass to another on a cluster by cluster basis. And especially if you want to have a bird's eye view across all your clusters and aggregate view, or to correlate across your clusters, that proves very challenging with the existing tool set. So we're bringing a new approach, a single pane of glass to integrate all these views of your overall domain. Additionally, we want to, sort of, we want to simplify advanced use cases. So when, when we're deploying or say upgrading a given microservice to a new one, there's multiple ways this can be done. There's the classic simple blue-green deployment. It says, okay, we got say a machine learning microservice version one, and we've just developed a new version two, well, we can just change that pointer at a given point, a given instant in time, and then we've cut over. It's a simple deployment, um, and we can roll back just as easily by changing the pointer again. This gives us continuous upgrade capabilities. However, we can improve this model and de-risk it by using a canary-based approach with traffic management. What we mean by this is say, okay, rather than just cutting it over digitally zero to one at a given instant in time, let us gradually direct traffic to the new uh, service. And then as we see it perform and the confidence of it is you know, gained, then we can increase the amount of traffic we direct to it. And then we can always adjust up and down however we choose to. And this will certainly then de-risk that, uh, that deployment and uh, make it more, uh, increase its availability and the user experience in the process. Another use case that's very challenging to enable is circuit breaking. Now, in this instance, my two orange containers are the same version. They're not two different versions, but one is very healthy and very stable, and the other is experiencing some issues. Well, at a certain point in time, I, want, I might want to set a threshold that says, you know, if the health degrades below this threshold, I might want to just trip that circuit and say, I don't even want any more workloads sent to that microservice because I want to preserve that user and the application experience. And so I'm just going to remove it from that load balancing option and eject it until we, we see a recovery of that health. However, we want to define health there and we'll show ways of doing that. Now, before I go any further, I want to comment is that, yeah, there are some players in this space because these are very well-known problems uh, in the Kubernetes um, application architecture and service mesh in general. But uh, the next few slides, I really want to show where Cisco is differentiating, doing things that nobody is doing. And when we talk about these, what you're going to see as a running theme is we're taking um, designs and approaches and technology, if you will, that we've already deployed and, and enabled in networking into a new technology domain, the cloud native domain. So this one, for instance, if we have a multi-cluster environment and then a service mesh in each cluster, well then how do we manage a control plane? This is very then similar to the uh, first hop redundancy protocol um, that you know we've had hot standby routing protocol, HSRP, where you'd have one router that's active and one that's standby. That's the traditional approach for availability here. But what we're bringing is very analogous to what we brought decades ago with global uh, load balancing protocol or gateway load balancing protocol, pardon me, G GLBP, uh, that had active, active uh, first hop uh, redundancy. And so we're doing the same type of thing, active, active control plane across clusters. So having an increased availability and resiliency, again, that nobody else is doing. Another aspect that we're bringing that's unique is multi-tenancy. We're taking all our abilities and, and design knowledge from managing multi-tenancy, recognizing that instead of just having a single ingress break gateway per mesh, we can have multiple of these and then define very specific rules and therefore allow for very segmented use of the shared resources in these environments to support multi-tenancy and segmentation, even directly connecting uh, external clients to specific workloads. We can support all of this type of flexibility. And then finally, just want to talk about 
synchronous versus asynchronous communication. Service meshes are very much aligned and optimized for synchronous communication, request, reply. Whereas a lot of different data flows follow an asynchronous pattern of communication, particularly if these are event driven. And so when you have tools like Apache Kafka that are monitoring events and streaming events, these are very asynchronous. So some customers are saying, okay, well, I have a service mesh for all my synchronous communications. I need now another solution for asynchronous. Well, now I have two, like maybe an event mesh. Now I have two meshes to support. Well, we're actually optimizing a single service mesh for both synchronous and asynchronous communications. And again, this is a very unique uh, differentiation and ability. Let me uh, show uh, a demo now of this solution, uh, Service Mesh Manager. And then at a high level, we see our, our dashboard. Uh, but let's start with, say, the mesh itself. We talked about managing uh, different control planes. Here I have two different versions of Istio. And then by clicking on any either of these control planes, I can see not only how the resources are allocated across uh, the, the control planes, but also if I'm about to consider an upgrade, I can do a validation to say, okay, before I upgrade to the new version of Istio, is there anything I need to be aware of? And then that's also brought up to my attention. One of the views, I, my preferred view here is the topology view, where I have an overall topology that is shown to me and not only shows how everything is interconnected, even though this is across multiple cluster environments and it could be in a hybrid environment or across different cloud providers, but it's also telling me a lot about the health of how everything is operating. So for instance, yesterday I was injecting some faults into my system just to make it more interesting. I can, of course, you know, um, we have a time series database. I can go back in time to that point where I've injected all these faults. And then if you if we take another look at our overall topology, you can see that the health of different services has been indicated as either red, or orange, et cetera, as they're degrading accordingly. And I don't need to you know, pull up a view to Grafana to get these metrics and a different view for Kiali for the topology. I can see them all in a single integrated view. So it's a, it's a real benefit to an operator. Now we talked about some of these uh, advanced use case deployments. If I look here and zoom in on my movies application, I see that movies here has three different versions, V1, V2, V3. Now let's say, you know, by default, if I'm load balancing across these different um, services, it probably roughly an equal load balance. Approximately one third of traffic is going to each one of these. Well, I could do better than that. I can leverage my ability to manage the traffic across the service mesh, and then I can have a more granular uh, solution, more uh, a canary-based uh, solution, and I can uh, manage the traffic according to my overall preferences to say, okay, maybe I'm going to do a 60-30-10 split, and then I just click apply, and it's that simple to do. I don't have to deal with complex YAML uh, files like uh, this one here, which is defining a virtual service and going into the appropriate, uh, you know, the specific variables. I don't need that level of expertise. I make it very, very simple. Similarly with circuit breaking, I can have a circuit breaking policies that I can just define, okay, what do I want to manage where it comes to health? I can manage, for instance, retries or consecutive errors and whatever thresholds I present, I say, okay, at a given threshold, uh, if it violates this, I'm just going to eject it from the load balancing decision. Um, similarly to, I can manage my mutual transport layer security, either strict, which means that all connections are encrypted, permissive, only if you receive an encrypted connection, you establish an encryption in reply, or I can set default policies for my whole mesh. And the last thing I want to show here, I think is really cool, is basically Wireshark for my service mesh scenario where I'm going to say, okay, in my, I can take a look at all the traffic across my entire cloud native domain live as it's happening. And let me see, I'm just going to wait for something interesting to show up in a second. And hopefully we'll get one soon. I can not only see these um, all, you know, the packets, the protocols, the methods, the paths. <laughs> when you're looking for something, 
It's not always, oh my goodness. But I can see all these things also in an integrated trace. I'm not, uh, I'm not getting one of those options right now. But anyways, I have tremendous amount of visibility at my disposal uh, within the tool. Now, let me switch gears and talk now about uh, security. So with security, application security, for years, we've compensated for security um, that may or may not be present within the app by using network technologies. For instance, if we had an application and the data for the application, uh, we might throw a firewall from the network to protect that from external threats, whether it's a physical or even virtual firewall. If the application itself didn't uh, natively support, say, encryption, we might then just, again, compensate via the network by creating the necessary encryption and tunnels and head ends, et cetera. But when we have such diffuse, dynamic, and distributed environments, where do we put these firewalls? Where do we put these VPN head ends? How do we manage the encryption and the policy and these kind of environments? It's a whole new world of complexity. But at the same time, we can solve these challenges, again, by leveraging our expertise. And to do this, we have to recognize that these cloud native apps have new security uh, requirements that we didn't have before. We have to, uh, we have very little visibility and there's so many different layers from the images, the libraries, the dependencies, the pipelines, the runtimes, the connections, the APIs, so on and so forth. All of these layers need to be secured and you want to be able to manage these from a single pane of glass. So we're, we're addressing these. Additionally, a key goal here is to say, we don't just want security to be a runtime concern, kind of like an afterthought to the development process. Once the application is running, then we think about security. No, we really want to shift that left to say, okay, let's also get security to be accessible and make um, have the, the persona doing DevOps to be able to make good security hygiene decisions in their roles, as well as Let's even share some of that security um, thinking and expertise with the developer so that they can make good decisions as they're developing and writing the code, shifting the entire process left. And we'll show, we'll show examples of that in our demonstration shortly. Now, what makes our solution, again, very unique here? Well, there are some competitors in the container security space. Um, their primary approach is an agent-based approach. It says, okay, we're gonna throw agents on every single Kubernetes node within a cluster and monitor what's going on uh, that way. Well, it's a very heavy lift. It, it doesn't scale that well, it doesn't perform that well. Uh, we have a much better approach. And so this, this approach is based on our acquisition of a port shift about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And like the former tool, uh, Service Mesh Manager was also based on our acquisition of Bonsai uh, Cloud. And so here we use a very, I think it's a very elegant approach where only the only dedicated resource is a single pod per cluster. And why is that? Because we integrate with the Kubernetes API server to leverage the admission control capabilities already present natively in that, uh, in that um, object in order to you know, set, discover, and enforce policy. So very, very efficient approach. Not only that, but then we can also expand container security by leveraging capabilities within the service mesh. Typically, when we wrap a container in a pod, it's a general rule is just a single container gets wrapped in a pod, but with a service mesh, we have this sidecar, this proxy that provides some additional unique, consistent services and then those services are in turn managed by control planes such as the Istio control plane in the case of uh, Istio service mesh. But we also inject some additional um, secure application cloud native functionality into these sidecars as well as a DNS detector so we can enforce DNS policies. And then we have all of this not only managed by the Istio our control plane but also our own internal controller. And the final slide in this section, is talking about how we then can make intelligent decisions with respect to APIs. For instance, we get information from Cisco Talos, from Umbrella, from third-party sources like BitSight about different APIs, their vulnerabilities, their risk assessments, et cetera, 
and then we're all ingesting this and constantly uh, getting that updated information. And then we can present rules, the compliance-based rules to say even developers to say, okay, these are the set of APIs that you should be selecting from because they don't have the time to do an extensive security investigation to say, oh, I just, I need an API that does this. I'll, I'll just choose from the top of my list and I'm good to go. They don't really do the extensive security uh, research to make a, a good decision that way. But if we present a curated list that meets our overall compliance, then we can again, shift that security decision left in that overall process. Not only that, but we can then monitor in runtime environment what's going on with our connections and then if there's a violation to any security or api rule that we've established we can immediately take action including uh, terminating uh, those apis so let's take a look at this secure this policy uh this sorry solution in action and i want to point everyone's attention to if you just go to securecn.cisco.com you'll see that there's a button here called free trial anyone can sign up for this and anyone can get full access to this entire solution, full functional access, no time limits. The only limitation is scale. You're limited to five Kubernetes nodes, but you can basically take this for a full test drive for as long as you like. And this is a really important new approach that we're using to uh, what's called product-led growth, to gain adoption by by um, getting free trials uh, going and making it very accessible and easy for people to do just that. So when we log in, one of the first things I recommend uh, people do is to do this, uh, generate the report over on the top right, which basically will give us a report that's oriented for CISO level of concerns for the overall environment. Where are your risks in your containers, your images, your pipeline, runtime, et cetera, as well as your API. And then it will generate that report. You can download it here. You see, it doesn't take long at all. And then that's a great place to start because then it gives you that high level summary. Um, and you can also be presented to a CISO to say, okay, this is what we've uh, already scanned and identified in your given environment as far as your risks and concerns, as well as then recommendations on how to address them. So from our main dashboard, we have all these top security risks, whether it's for pods or APIs, et cetera. We also have, we recognize that the MITRE framework is a very popular uh, framework that shows the different phases of attacks that is commonly, are commonly utilized, as well as then the knowledge base of recommendations on how to address these. And what I really like about this is that it not only lays out the overall vulnerabilities within this framework, but let's say we click on one of them and say, okay, deleting Kubernetes uh, events, for example. Why is this important? Well, this is one way that attackers can cover their tracks. We have a lot of different elements that are affected uh, within our environment by this attack. We're not just being informed of this attack, but we can repair it just with a few clicks and say, okay, these are all the systems that are going to be affected and uh, all the the rule that's going to be created and I just click apply now and a new rule is now addressed to prevent that type of vulner, um, attack vulnerability and it's that simple and you can see that okay now I've checked that off it becomes very easy for me to apply good knowledge base proven security hygiene to my environment just by a few clicks at a time for my overall view of my systems I have I really like this too because we recognize that there's multiple personas that we're looking to address. For instance, let me start with the DevOps persona. The DevOps persona, he cares about the systems, the workloads, the services, the interconnections, et cetera. And so we have a view that's tailored to the DevOps persona. However, we can also just at the click of this toggle button, switch views to a security oriented persona, where we're looking at the same information but through a different lens, the security-based lens. We can see which of our elements are critical risk or high risk, medium risk, which of our connections are encrypted versus not encrypted, or even in this case, we see that we have some block connections. We can click on them and get additional details uh, of all these specific connections as well. If I return to say my dashboard, I can say, okay, for my pods, which are my most riskiest pods in my overall cloud native environment? I can see here that Nginx is flagged as one, and why is that? 
Well, first of all, it's a public facing workload. You can see that and it can have its privileges escalated. It could even be run as root. And then we can see all the places in my environment um, where that's where that applies. And therefore, I am probably don't want that uh, vulnerability within my environment. And then I can look at not only these individual workloads, but even, for instance, the CVEs that are associated with them that will give information on when a given vulnerability was introduced, when a given vulnerability was fixed, so that I can make sure that even in my pipeline, I have secure uh, images, libraries, dependencies uh, that uh, have all of these things addressed, these vulnerabilities addressed, so that I can maintain my overall security posture. And I can even do runtime scanning of my workloads. And then finally, let me just talk about the APIs and the policies there. So for instance, I noticed that I had some APIs that were, were uh, rated as risky. And so if I take a look at these APIs and say, okay, well, why are, what's, a critic, what's the risk here? Why is this labeled a, a critical risk? I can double click on that security posture and I can see all the risks. I see three critical risks, 30 medium risk, and three, uh, a few low risk. But this specific one that's being called out is for an insecure TLS version. It's being reported by BitSight and say this particular API is using a deprecated version of TLS that's been known to uh, support man in the middle uh, vulnerabilities like uh, attacks like uh, Poodle and Beast. Therefore, you probably don't want to use that API. As a developer, I'd probably be completely oblivious to that. But I also then have a list of which of those API providers have that um, risk associated with them. So I can make intelligent secure decisions there. I could even just select the same API, but from a different provider that didn't have that particular risk. I can even set policies. Like for instance, right now, a lot of businesses are say pulling out of Russia because of political concerns or security concerns. Well, I might have that as a compliance requirement. And so I might set, I can set a policy maybe there. It says uh, no API, sourced from Russia. That might be a new uh, compliance requirement. And then basically I'll say, okay, look, I'm gonna select either APIs or providers or endpoints. In this case, I'm gonna look at closely the API provider and I'm gonna specify their endpoints. And then I'll say, okay, I'll accept APIs in my organization unless they're Unless they're based in Russia, and then I just click that rule, and then boom, it's that easy to do to set and enforce these type of policies in my overall environment. Okay, the overall summary is that cloud native, yeah, it drives a lot of business benefits from flexibility, portability. Uh, we also have um, resiliency, uh, all these all these benefits from the cloud native architecture. But at the same time, it also presents new technology challenges. We're meeting those challenges with some new technology solutions, drawing on our expertise in networking, applying it to cloud native domains, particularly the service niche, drawing on our expertise in security, and again, applying it to cloud native uh, domains, whether it's containers or APIs or again, the mesh. We're also offering these solutions. We want people to adopt them, you know? So we're making it incredibly easy. This product-led growth strategy, you just click up, you have a free trial and you get the full functionality with an unlimited time span. So to really, you know, take that test drive for as long as you want. And then we're already offering it with our secure application cloud solution that we are demonstrating. And here's where you just click on that to take it for a test drive or even service mesh manager, we set up a sandbox environments for that, but we'll have a full free tier solution uh, coming shortly for that as well. And then if you want to follow the solutions that we're actively developing in ETNI, again, that's the R&D branch of Cisco. Uh, we, this is our website where we share all those latest exciting ventures and uh, that are being developed for incubation. The vulnerabilities you were showing, is it that's tied into the Cloud Insights product or is this completely separate or? sharing information or where does that come from? So they're separate at this time, but we do ingest information from Cisco Talus, uh, which is a common set as well as Umbrella. So there are some common sources of the information, but we don't have a direct 
high end yet. This is still, again, very early developing uh, incubating technologies uh, that we're now making available and working closely with uh, business groups like App Dynamics to to bring to the market. However, you know, there's definitely more room for integration within our overall security portfolio. So that could very well be some additional tie-ins that we investigate for future versions. But at this time, there isn't a direct connection other than saying, sharing those, leveraging those sources of truth like Cisco Talus or Umbrella for information. 